it's something, but is that awesome? Is, is it worth doing something? You know, I don't know. You tell me, right? You'd have to look at your company and say, is, is that enough that I care? Maybe, maybe not, but... Well, so I suspect that perhaps people who are using IPv6 have newer equipment. So is there any, I mean, so when you say the performance yeah, but, was but better. The, the, the newer equipment is using both IPv4 and IPv6, and they're measuring it from the same equipment. Okay. The performance right. is better with IPv6. So it's, it's, not, it's not the handset. They, they don't know conclusively what it is, but it definitely isn't the handset, because the, it's the same handset is using both v4 and v6. When you say they suspect it might be because of CGN, <coughs> uh, does that mean because they're not going through CGN with IPv6? Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so it should uh, reduce latency, too. Though. Well, there's no NAND at all, is it? Exactly. Here's, not even the first layer. Here's part of what I suspect is if I do CGN, instead of going straight to the device, mm -hmm. I'm going over here. Yeah. Right? So if over here happens to be out of the way or this guy happens to be loaded, even a little bit. So it's another that, hop with some translation. That's right. Place. So now, some people have done studies and say that they don't see that much, so I, I don't know. It's, it's a possibility. Yes? What is the, uh, or is there any uh, increased overhead due to the longer ADSs in each packet? That's true. There, there is, um, so the, the header size is double. It goes from 20 to 40 bytes. Um, however, However, um, for practical purposes, um, it, it's really not significant it, because there's, there's a lot of things, um, you know, anybody doing virtualization, they put all kinds of headers on that are far bigger than that, and they still don't notice a significant difference. So I would say it's, you know, really it's not, not a significant amount. Uh, is there difficulty routing between the two? That is a good question, but let me, let me, let me come back to that because I, I have a slide on that. Okay, last question, and then I, I love the questions, but i got to move this forward. I'm going to run out of time. Yes. Okay, you mentioned this really early on, and if you're going to get back to it later, I can wait. But my big reluctance is tying my internal address space to the, um, to the provider assigned network address. Okay, that's, that's an excellent question, and let me, I'm not going to directly answer it, but, but let me go through this, and then I'd be happy to talk to you more if, um, at the end. Okay. Okay, so one other thing I want to talk about is mobile. So, the big fear back in 2011, 2012, is we knew we were going to run out of IPv4 addresses. But we didn't, the, back in 2011, we didn't really think that CGN was going to take off, right? So, a lot of people thought there's going to be IPv6 only users, there's not going to be, there's not going to be any way to talk to IPv4, and you have to support IPv6 or you're going to be SOL. Um, that didn't happen. So, and so, there are actually IPv6 only users. So, in the US, T-Mobile USA, which is the third biggest wireless carrier, they do IPv6 only for the vast majority of their devices. However, they have a translation service to get you to IPv4. So, so that was the part that wasn't predicted. So if you look at how this works, I have, I have a smartphone that gets an IPv6 address. And then basically, if I'm going to Google, which natively supports IPv6, then I just go straight to the site, and I'm good. However, you know, most of the internet is still only IPv4. So if it's an IPv4 address, um, basically when I do a DNS query, I'm going to use a special server that has what's called a DNS 6.4 service. And that DNS server is going to go, uh-oh, there's no IPv6 resource record. So it's going to synthesize or create one. It'll basically take the IPv4 address, turn it into a hex, um, add it on to an IPv6 prefix, and then send that back as the answer. That prefix will route the traffic to a NAT64 gateway. Mm. The NAT64 gateway then translates it to IPv4, uses the embedded address to say that's where you're going, and then sends it on its way. Wow. However, to do that, the D especially, the, especially the DNS64 part, it, it is not, it is a significant amount of time. I mean, we're, you know, we're only really talking, you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds, but, you know, if you're over 150 milliseconds, your users are noticing. So if you're a big site, it's probably not a problem because you'll be cached, but if you're a smaller site, that's a little bit of an issue. So if you don't support IPv6 <coughs> on the mobile front, then you have you know, 60 to 70 million users that are not getting optimal performance. 
The other thing is, not everything works through NAT64. Most stuff does, 80 to 90 percent, but T-Mobile will tell you some stuff doesn't work. So if you're like a major app like Skype that doesn't use NAT64, then they actually created something called 464 XLA. So we basically think that we, we pretend that we have IPv4 on the handset, even though we don't, then we, and we basically tag certain applications like Skype. Say, so okay, if Skype tries to send traffic, pretend like we have an IPv4 address, then translate that traffic to IPv6, send it to the NAT64 gateway, and then that spits it back out as IPv4. That's called 464 excellent. And, and so I'm kind of rushing through this, but the point is, that's only if you're a major <coughs> app like Skype. If you're not a major app, and you don't work through NAT64, guess what happens when somebody tries to go to your service through T-Mobile? It doesn't work. And you know what? Who is the user going to blame? Are they gonna call up T-Mobile and say, why can't I get to this site? <laughs> no, they are not. They're gonna tell you that your site sucks and they're gonna go somewhere else, right? Because people, I, I can tell you from working through this issue, an end user always blames the end site. They, they don't understand the internet, they don't wanna understand it. You know, basically, like if I talk to my wife, either Facebook's working or it's not. <laughs> Honey, Facebook's broken, fix it, right? <laughs> you know, my wife is a sharp person, but she doesn't care about networking details. I wanna get to Facebook, make it work. You know, I, I don't care about the details. The end user, that's how end users are, right? So this is one thing, if you're in the mobile space, this is significant, right? Because T-Mobile has almost 70 million subscribers. So this is definitely something you should factor in. You should at least test your app and make sure it works to your NAT64. Okay. Probably spent too long on that part. Um, so coming back to your question is, uh, if I am an enterprise or an organization, if your if your home is a lot simpler, what makes sense to consider with IPv6? So if it were my company and I had you know a sizable company that was you know like a billion dollars or more. Would I deploy IPv6 internally right now? Probably not, right? Because if I'm talking about, if I have you know, hundreds or thousands of sites and tens or hundreds of thousands of nodes, can you imagine how much work it would be for me to put IPv6 on all those? That's a lot of work, right? For, for you know, hazy benefit, if any, I think that's a tough case. However, what I would consider is at least put it on the edge, right? Because we know it's coming, we're past critical mass. We've shown sustained growth, sustained exponential growth for four years now. So, so this is pretty serious. So I need to start ramping up my people so at least they get their toes wet and start getting around it. So what I would do is, at my edge, the first thing I would do is I would talk to my ISP and I would get them to, to, to dual stack me. So I have V4 and V6. So any major ISP will have this. If your ISP, if you, if you have a business grade ISP that cannot give you IPv6, honestly, when your contract is up, you, you should go somewhere else. I mean, that, that's, at this point, that's pretty sad. I, I haven't run into that for a while. Tier ones, tier twos, I think all, even, even the small ones that don't offer for residential, as far as I know, they all offer for businesses. So I'd be surprised if you still ran into it, but if you did, I mean, there's so many other things out of the shop. So on your border router, that's where I would turn it on first. When you turn it on, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, and the reason that is, just to skip ahead a little, is IPv4 and IPv6, there's kind of a saying in the network world called ships in the night. So IPv4 and IPv6, they're basically like two ships passing each other in the night. So if I'm a passenger on one of these ships, and I'm passing this ship by in the middle of the night. Do I interact with the passengers on the other ship? No, I'm basically completely oblivious to them, right? So IPv4 and IPv6, they are completely in parallel. They are orthogonal, they do not interact at all. So this is one thing that's a little confusing. If I tell you that you know, IPX or SNA and IP don't interact, that's kind of easy, right? Because they have different names. But IPv4, IP, I mean, aren't they both IP? No. They are totally dissimilar. So I mean, there, there is a relationship, but on the wire, they are totally orthogonal to each other. There is no interaction at all. So that, I know a lot of people have a hard time with that. So, so there are some consequences like, uh, for example, um, one thing that you have to be careful is, if you take your internet router and it's running SNMP, right? And you probably lock it down so only your SNMP management station can access it. Well, if you enable IPv6, 
by default, it's wide open to the entire internet, which is probably not what you want, right? Because that IPv4 access control <coughs> has no impact on IPv6. So all the security controls you have in IPv4, you have to figure out how to do that in IPv6. It's going to be different. It will not be the same. So that, that's one thing you have to be careful on. Um, you know, however, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's just, you know, looking in the manual, figuring out how I do it, and away you go. So what I would do is, I'd start out with the border routers. It's time to ask, Gen what are we really investing for? Generally, it's not a big deal to deploy it there, and then I can just incrementally bring it in. On any modern equipment, like any modern Cisco device, they've been supporting IPv6 for like 10 years, and unless you're way behind in code or have really old devices, for your perimeter devices for all this, this really shouldn't be a big deal. And you basically gradually bring it in. You know, first the border routers, then the firewalls, to answer your question, I would not bring it into my corporate network. I just, you know, I mean, if you're a small company and, you, and you're, you like it or something, or maybe you're a high tech company and you have lots of brilliant people that like doing things for fun, but for a typical company, I probably wouldn't bring it here. I would stop on the edge. And I would basically look at incrementally enabling it on my DMZ. So for example, to support VPN is an easy one. All I have to do is I put IPv6 just on the internet facing interface Basically, an IPv6 only user can VPN into the company, and I can still assign them an IPv4 address. So everything is exactly the same as it is today. The only difference is the initial connection or the outer tunnel is IPv6. If I have a partner in Singapore that can't get a public IPv4 address, same thing. I can build my site-to-site -site connection using IPv6, but all my internal traffic that I and my users actually see can still be IPv4. So IPv6 can actually be really helpful in a lot of cases, and this this is this is not hard at all. Um, I mean, there are there are a, little, a few tricks with interoperability, but I mean it, it's straightforward infrastructure stuff. Anybody who's dealt with infrastructure would know exactly how to address any of these problems. Same thing, DNS, very easy. Load balancer, load balancer is <coughs> so easy to do. You're going to be surprised. If I want to support IPv6, so I take my web server, I basically have my load balancer have an IPv6 VIP. My application stays IPv4. People talk to my load balancer over IPv6 and it translates to IPv4. Very easy to set up. Now my server speaks IPv6. But I didn't have to change anything on the back end. Now you still have to do some testing. You know, you might, you might find some components don't like it. But for the most part, it works pretty well and requires minor changes, if any. It's the same thing. Email, uh, email, we'll talk, he's not quite ready. And then for IPv6 only internet sites, there are some, but only really because they choose to be. But again, you don't, have to, you don't have to let your users have direct access. You can set up a proxy. There's lots of good open source ones. So if there happens to be some kind of IPv6 only internet service, your users can get to it through a proxy. Right? So that, that's, that's where I would focus on. And when I have done work with companies, this, this, is, this is what we've done. Right? Focus on the edge, reasonable minimum, incremental approach. And when do I do this? You know, maybe in a year or two, right? Figure out how long it would take me. And re really, I have to define for my company, when does it get interesting? When is there enough of, of a benefit to, to go further? You'd still be beholden to the provider address, though, right, in that scenario? Which means that if you cancel your contract, switch providers, you're going to have to figure out how to if renumber everything, right? If you're multi-homed, you automatically qualify to get addresses directly from here. But if you're in that uncomfortable small business spot where you're not big enough to be yeah, multi-homed, that's, that's, you, that's a huge... In, it's a That's huge liability true, cost can, that you're um, holding. But uh, as, as much as the IPv6 crowd would hate to admit it, you can still do that. Okay. So. I've read some conflicting articles. I've never tested it, but. Yeah, not 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 everything supports it, but it's more and more common. So okay. so it's still an option. So but 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 again, if you if you limit it to a small area, a few pieces of equipment, it's not a major investment. It's not that. And if you have to change IPv6, remember it has no impact on IPv4, right? So the impact is relatively small. I talked about this, about watching it with the uh, security devices. Okay. And um, if you host content or downloads or something like that, there is an easy button with CDNs. So Akamai, I already mentioned. Limelight's another one. Cloud, Cloudflare is kind of like the darling. Everybody loves them. I think they're really cheap because I even know a lot of blog sites that use Cloudflare. So there's, there's lots of options if you want to do it and you want an easy button so you don't have to deal with anything. You can just use one of these guys and basically they act as a reverse proxy for you.
And actually, in the case of Cloudflare, I know they do all kinds of advanced caching, and you might even get better performance. So you know, if, if you're interested but don't want to do any work yourself, that's worth looking into. OK, um, so when I talked to Jim, I, I, was, I was thinking I was going to go through a lot of these, but, but really a lot of these, like if I was going to talk about Quagga, I, that'd probably be a whole talk by itself. And I don't, you know, I, this isn't really exactly a hardcore network crowd, so I, I think a lot of you guys might be bored with that. Um, so I, but I, I listed them. So especially in the routing space, I've done, a, I've done some research there. Um, if you're going to use one, I use Quagga. So if anybody deals with open source networking, probably the biggest name right now is Cumulus. You may or may not have heard of them. But Cumulus, they basically use all open source for their networking stuff, and they contribute back, and they use Quag. So if you're going to use an open source routing daemon, and that supports BGP, OSPF, you know, pretty much everything, that's the one to use. Now, if you're an enterprise and you're on Quagga, I think you're nuts. <laughs> if, you're, if you're an enter, I mean, I hate to say it, but um, for the high end, you got to get a commercial solution. You should stick with Cisco or Juniper or, or somebody on that level. Um, but you know, for the mid space and below, I think Quag is pretty pretty solid. Um, and then I, I mentioned some other ones. Load balancing. I'm actually going to do a small demo with HA Proxy. Um, I don't do as much with this stuff, but but my kind of straw poll sense is that HA Proxy is the most popular. Nginx is also really popular, and so is uh, LBS. Um, but just some ones, you know, just some ones you can look into if you're curious. And then for proxy, Squid is the most popular. Not necessarily the best performing, but the most popular. I put in some other alternatives, and then I just threw some other stuff in. So, so, that, so if you know, if, if you want to stick with open source, there are a lot of good options for this that all support IPv6. All right. So, what I wanted to show is. Um, So, yeah, forgive me, I'm not a Docker whiz. So, so I basically have a container in Docker. And it's basically using Docker 1 as, um, as the network. And as you can see, it only has IPv4. Right? So this is a typical company. Only has an IPv4 address. <coughs> and what I can do is... So uh, this might be gibberish if you never looked at HA proxy, but I mean it's 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 a typical load balancing application. So in a load balancing application, I'm going to say what's my VIP or my virtual address that I listen on. So the, the VIP is what does the end user actually connect to with the load balancer services, and then the load balancer proxies that connection and then turns around and picks the real server that, that actually serves the data. So this is what it looks like if I do IPv4 bind space star colon 80. So any address on the HTTP order service, listens to them. All I have to do is change it to the IPv6 location, which supports both v4 and v6. That's literally all I changed. Very simple change. As long as one of the interfaces on my box has both IPv4 and IPv6, now the load balancer is dual stacked. And just doing that, it'll now translate any incoming IPv6 request to IPv4. That's it. It's, it's, really, it's that easy. Now, I don't want to say this is totally painless. You know, when I work with people, um, you know, if, if you have a, if you do a lot of stuff with, you know, um, Flash or Silverlight or complex Java stuff, you know, you might have to do some tweaks. But, but actually, it's usually, I would say, 80 to 90% of stuff just works. And then the rest of the stuff needs some little tweaks. So it's relatively easy. And then if I go back to. 
Okay, so this is a super basic website, but enough to get the idea. So there's actually a, a kind of a cool plugin for Chrome and Firefox. It's called IPv Foo for Chrome and IPv Fox for Firefox. And that's this guy up here. And what this does is <coughs> that basically shows me what am I connecting to. So on a typical website, you might have 30 things. And for each element, it's going to show you what's the address, v4, or v6. So you can actually <coughs> see. And then what I can do is I can go back up here. <coughs> yep, it's kind of hard to see from this side. Oh, I forgot. I forgot my company helpfully blocks all my PV6 traffic, so I have to be safe on my firewall. <laughs> Always a good time to grab a book. Is HA proxy running on that server? It that is. Yeah. All right. Well, I apologize. I did not try my demo when I got here. So. <laughs> but I'm a little bummed that that didn't work. But I, I will say that um, you know, t typically I'm, I'm running that in a VM, so it makes it a little trickier. But typically, it, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. So if, if I have any major load balancer or F5, um, I'm drawing a blank now, but Citrus is load balancer, HA proxy, anything like that. It's basically very straightforward. My VIP, I set up for v4 and v6. My server configuration on the back end is the same, and, and really that's it. If I have routing and everything set up correctly, it just works. So it's very straightforward. So, so especially for publishing your apps, it's, it's, not, it's not a lot of effort because it, it, unless your old load balancer is pretty ancient, most applications are going to use a load balancer to front end. So it's literally just going to that load balancer and configuring it to support IPv6, and that's it. So it's, it's not a lot of work. Okay, um, email, email is not quite there yet. Um, so uh, basically, if I look at email, um, this is just for the top 500 sites. Um, I don't know of any great global statistic for email. Um, it's not as well tracked as the web. Um, Cisco says one to two percent of internet email is IPv6, and that, that probably sounds about right. Um, the challenge with email is and depending on who I ask, I get a different story. But from what I gather, a large component of blocking spam is based on address reputation. And for IPv4, where I only have 4 billion addresses, that's a pretty easy problem. However, for IPv6, uh, just in one network, I have 18 quadrillion addresses. And, and the number of addresses is like 300 and something under slam. I, it's basically meaningless. The number of addresses in IPv6 is, is too big to comprehend. It's, it's insanely big. And so the challenge is, if I try and have an address-based reputation system, it would be the, the, the database would be so big that you couldn't download it, you couldn't distribute it. 
right? So it doesn't work, right? So the, the current model does not work with IPv6. And um, I think we're still kind of in the research phases. You know, I mean, I can still do all my domain stuff. I can still do all my authentication stuff. I still have some options, but my address-based stuff is, is now pretty much worthless. Um, you know, and there's some proposals, what if I just use a network or this or that, but it, it really, it's still early days. So because of that, it might be worth playing around and making sure your on-premise or cloud solution supports it. Most of them do. Um, but would I actually turn on IPv6 email and leave it on? Probably not. Um, and then just kind of doing a little research here, if I look at the top email providers in the US are basically Google, Yahoo, Hotmail, AOL, and Comcast, believe it or not, are the top five. And I believe only, um, only Google and Comcast support IPv6 email and only inbound. So, I mean, that gives you an idea, right? If most of the major providers don't do it, you know, I, I don't, I think email is not quite ready for, for prime time yet. Okay, and one, um, one other thing I wanted to show too is another common question I get is, uh, especially because um, a lot of people are unclear that IPv4 and IPv6 are totally different protocols. Is, I mean, can I just net it? Can I just put a NAT gateway at the edge and translate all my IPv4 users to IPv6? You know, why can't I do that? So I wanted to take a minute to talk about um, the ITF is who does all the standards for the internet and for communications. And they came up with an RFC 6144 that basically talks about this problem. If I have an IPv4 network or an internet and an IPv6 network or internet, and I want them to be able to talk to each other, I'm gonna stick a translation device in the middle and I have eight use cases. And I want to look at each one of those use cases to see what is possible. So then this shows. So if I have, uh, I'm not going to read through all of them, but you can see and you can get the deck. So that there's two variations. There's stateful and stateless. So in the IPv4 world, we only have stateful. Stateful means that when I do NAT, the device doing the NAT actually has to keep a record in memory. So when the connection comes back through the router, it looks up its connection table it has to find a match and then it unnats it. If I reboot that router or it crashes or something like that, then my connection's hosed, right? It's gonna fail. That's a stateful connection. Um, so that's a bit of a problem too with CGN because in TCP IP, the more state that we push into the network, the more fragile the network is. So if I have a stateless network, I can reboot stuff, I can take it down, I can change paths and you, do, you won't even notice. It's just, it's instant. It's great, but that's how you want a network. You want a network so I can take half my network down to service it and nobody notices. However, if I have stateful, then I can't do that. Or if I do do that, then I have to have complex high availability schemes because if I do something that disrupts the machine holding the state, then it fails and disrupts all that traffic. So that's kind of a challenge with that. Now, um, stateless is where we use, um, one, one second, Gibson and I'll get you, is uh, stateless is where I have an algorithmic mapping, right? Where I use certain special addresses, and when it sees that address, it recognizes it and just knows what to do with no state. So the cool thing about stateless NAT is if we do that, and we reboot that router, and then the connection comes back through, it still works because no state is necessary. However, it's not as good as it sounds because when you look at the addressing restrictions, it's generally not very desirable, but, but it's an option. So this kind of goes through all the options, but what I want to point out is, if I look at use case seven and eight, can I go from the IPv6 internet to the IPv4 internet or vice versa? The answer is no, it is not possible. And that's because um, if I look at IPv6, it's so many orders of magnitude bigger than IPv4 that it's just not possible to scale a solution out that much. So I can't do it. So can I do subsets? Sure. You know, can I take one network and get it to another, or I can do limited restrictions? Yeah, I, I definitely have some options, but this is not a silver bullet. And there was another one, too, that was kind of popular. Um, can I take one IPv4 network, just one, and translate it to the IPv6 internet? And there was a predecessor. This is using NAT64. There was a predecessor to this called NATPT, and NATPT supported that. But NATPT was basically a <coughs> jettison because it was too slow performance was awful. At any significant scale, it, the performance doesn't cut it. And so basically the ITF said, doesn't cut it, tried it for years, can't get acceptable performance, so they scrapped it and they came out with a restricted subset, which is an ad 64. 
And so if I want decent performance, I cannot support that.